Okay, so this is an important question for USMLE. Students frequently get this wrong, even if they're already scoring well in practice assessment. So just going to jump through this here, give you an extra point or two on the NBME exams. 62-year-old dude with chest pain past couple hours could be many different things we keep reading. He's tachycardic at 115, tachypnic at 20, normal respiratory rate 12 to 16 per minute, hypotensive 85 on 60. We keep reading, pulse oximetry and room air 87%. Pulse oximetry refers to the percentage of your hemoglobin that's binding gas. And I say gas because normal pulse oximetry cannot differentiate between carbon monoxide and O2 that's sitting on the hemoglobin. There is a special type of CO pulse, oximet pulse oximeter, but this is high yield for USMLE questions. Don't want to get super fucking tangential right now, but it's just so high yield that you'll get some dude in the winter with a ventilator who has lightheadedness and he has a normal pulse oximetry and you're like hmm why the fuck is this pulse oximetry normal that's expected in co poisoning okay so we expect it to be 99 or 100 uh you watching this video we do a pulse oximeter on you 99 to 100 um if it falls below 94 so we're in the 93 and lower territory then that that's an indication to go to hospital patients who have covid uh, they need to go to hospital 93 or lower. I've seen 94% as normal in polycythemia vera questions, okay? So they have more hemoglobin to try to saturate. So it's predictable and expected that they are not going to be 99 or 100. USMLE likes to give you 94 in a polycythemia question when the hemoglobin is EG 20.5 grams per deciliter, but the PO2 will be normal. PO2 is your dissolved oxygen. Okay, so O2 content in the blood is your PO2, your dissolved oxygen, plus your HBO2, the amount that's bound to hemoglobin. Your pulse oximeter is reading the amount that's bound to hemoglobin, the saturation of that hemoglobin, okay? Quick 2CK detail is your indication for home oxygen therapy is going to be 89% saturation, which corresponds to 60 millimeters of mercury. If you have core pulmonale, or if you're at 88% saturation or 55 millimeters of mercury of oxygen, if you don't have core pulmonale. It's not that they ask you, does this patient need home oxygen therapy? It's more like you'll get an occasional rare question where home oxygen therapy will be an answer, but their, their saturation will be above those thresholds. And you're like, okay, like even though they're 92% room air, which is not good, they don't need home oxygen therapy yet, and you can eliminate that answer choice. That's how it works. So we're going to keep reading here. Uh, the dude has crackles bilaterally and chest auscultation. That is pulmonary edema that reflects the left heart failure. This is a myocardial infarction. So he's got a, if we look at the ECG, even if you're not sure what you're looking at, just take two steps back, chill the fuck out for two seconds, okay? We just look at this ECG. And he's got ST elevation in the anterior leads. This is an LAD infarct, okay? So uh, anterior MI in combination with the our two-line vignette here. So uh, he's going to have a backup increased afterload on the left atrium, increased left atrial pressure. LA pressure equals pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So increased hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary venules and capillaries. So he's going to have transidation of fluid into the pulmonary spaces, the alveolar spaces, and the interstitium, giving you the pulmonary edema here. So we are going to look at the answer choices, which is going to be reduced in a patient with MI. Start with choice A, arteriolar lactate. Wrong fucking answer. This could be increased, if anything. This is very challenging, this detail, for step one. For 2CK, also hard, but it's on IM. It's all over the IM and surgery assessments. If a patient is in shock, whether it's cardiogenic, as in this patient, hypovolemic, septic, we are not perfusing our vital organs as well as we should be, right? So isn't it safe to say that we are not getting the oxygen to our vital organs as we should be, and that there's going to be an increased propensity for anaerobic respiration and lactate production? It's not hard, right? Now that we mention it, but you're frequently, especially on 2CK, you're going to see a decreased serum bicarb, okay, uh, metabolic acidosis, secondary to lactic acidosis in shock questions. So you might get an MI where the bicarb's 18, normal range 22 to 28. You're like, hmm, why the fuck is the bicarb low? It's normal, it's expected, because uh, we'd have lactic acidosis in the setting of shock, okay? So we would expect increased arteriolar, arteriolar lactate, 
if anything, not reduced. So A is out. Pulmonary vascular resistance, this would be increased, if anything, because we would have increased pulmonary capillary hydrostatic pressure, as we mentioned before. So if we have more fluid in, more blood in the pulmonary vasculature, there's going to be a constriction of the tunica media to compensate to try to reduce that backward flow. So anytime you've got more flow in the pulmonary vessels uh, with a risk for pulmonary hypertension, we're going to constrict those vessels and we're going to have uh, an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, okay? So this patient, we'd expect either a normal or a slightly increased pulmonary vascular resistance just to compensate for that, that afterload, that backflow, to prevent that backflow, okay? So we look at choice C, renin release, wrong fucking answer. This would be increased, if anything. You say, hmm, why is that the case? Really, really important detail, especially for step one. If you have cardiac dysfunction, okay, we just mentioned you're not going to be perfusing your vital organs as well as you should be. So doesn't it make sense that you're not going to be perfusing your kidneys as well as you should be? So RAS, renin angiotensin aldosterone systems upregulated, right? So we actually get an increase in renin uh, with uh, cardiac dysfunction, whether it's an acute MI like this or classically in congestive heart failure, the left heart failure leading to an increase in RAS is actually what helps uh, induce the fluid retention and volume overload uh, in these patients, okay? So we would have increased RAS, if anything, not decreased. Uh, choice D, systemic vascular resistance, is going to be increased, not decreased. This is a challenging one. If our heart's not pumping as well as it should be and our blood pressure's low, aren't we going to try to constrict distally to compensate? So if we just think about it more like uh, mechanistically, if you have decreased pressure up top from your heart, you're going to constrict distally to try to back up that pressure to increase proximal pressure, right? You're going to have sympathetic activation in this guy because he's having an acute MI, which is going to cause increased catecholamine release binding to alpha-1 receptors on your systemic vasculature causing vasoconstriction. That's going to be your mechanism for uh, increased uh, systemic vascular resistance. Also, there's going to, because there's cardiac dysfunction, we're going to have a decreased stretch of the carotid sinus baroreceptors. So there's going to be our autoregulation where we're going to have decreased parasympathetic outflow, increased sympathetic outflow. Okay. A lot we can talk about. Don't want to fucking confuse you, but I think for in your case, you should just think in the setting of cardiac dysfunction where we have low blood pressure, uh, we could expect increased alpha-1 agonism to compensate so that we, we get vasoconstriction, increased pressure up top. This leaves us with choice E, venous oxygen tension. This is the correct answer. This is decreased. Now you say, well, why is this the case? That sounds weird. Not super complicated. It's more that if you have a pulse oximetry reading that's low, if your arteriolar oxygen is low, doesn't it make sense that therefore the oxygen that's ultimately making its way into the venous system is going to be less? I mean, if you have less oxygen going in, you're going to have less oxygen coming out. That's pretty much all it is. And the reason this is challenging is because it just it requires eliminating some of these other answer choices in the process. Okay, If you're not able to eliminate these answer choices, choice E becomes more equivocal and you're not sure about it. But if we're left with this, we say, well, yeah, that makes sense. If we have less arteriolar oxygen, wouldn't we have less venous oxygen? You know, so... That's pretty much it, okay? Uh, obviously, I'm going to make more content. Stay concise for these questions. So if you liked this clip, subscribe to my channel, and I appreciate your time. That's it.